uh, welcome everybody to this event. Um, we normally run a labor study seminar series um, down here at the university currently known as Rhodes. Apparently in the foreseeable future going to be known as Rhodes. My name is Lucien van der Volt. These labor study seminar series are a joint project. So they're run by the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit, NOLSU, and we partner with the departments of economics and economic history, of history and sociology. And in non-COVID times, we usually run partnerships as well. So if a speaker was coming down, we would normally bring them down, we'd do an event in East London, do one here in Makanda, and do something in PE or vice versa. So this is really about trying to build a critical space for engagement. Uh, it's trying to build a space where we can look at labor studies in the very broad sense. So this would include not just issues of say, uh, unemployment rates, but trade unions. It would also not just be about trade unions. We could also look at issues, the politics of left theory. We could look as we've done at the Marx anniversary, uh, bicentenary. We would look at, for example, labor history. We would look at rural organizing. So it's, it's quite a broad space and that's really what this is part of. And one of the nice things, I suppose a lot of not so nice things about the technologies that people are calling the fourth industrial revolution is that we're able to communicate these ways. So thank you everybody for coming today. Um, this seminar, which will be presented by Comrade Mometwe Sabe, is the first in the series where we're going to be looking at COVID-19 and the labor movement. And we've thought of different ways to kind of subtitle that. Is it a crisis inside the crisis? Are we gonna waste the crisis, uh, struggle, struggle against the crisis, struggle, we'll see. So, um, and what we've really tried to do is also get people that are, are thinking a bit uh, critically, thinking a bit out of the box. Now, Comrade Sabe, as, as you may know him, has been an active member of um, GUWUSA, the General Industrial Workers Union of South Africa, where he is, as, as I understand, uh, uh, president of that. He is also on the national executive of SOFTU, the South African Federation of Trade Unions, and he's been active in the working class movement for many years. He's also a member of the Worker and Socialist Party. And preceding this career as, as a Marxist revolutionary, he was involved as a student with um, the Pan-Africanist Students Movement of Azania, and he was, I uh, believe, Deputy President of the Pretoria, University of Pretoria, SRC. Did I get that right, Carl? I think so. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sabe. I, I think one thing just in terms of, of house rules, um, we, we're still learning the software a bit, so feel free to put questions in the chat side. If you don't want to put your video on, that's fine. You want to save a bit of bandwidth, that's fine. And um, yeah, thank you very much for everybody coming. I think others will join us as we move along, but let's let's move. Okay, Comrade Sabay, the is it the floor? It's yours, whatever it is. The stage, the stage is yours. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Comrade Lucien, and, and thank you, Comrade, um, for this invitation. Um, and really, you know, for the opportunity to have conversation with comrades that um, are contemplating the same issues as we are, which um, is how really we should be responding as the workers. And in a context of this crisis, that the ruling class, the capitalist class itself, is not wasting the crisis. They are fully exploiting and utilizing it to carry out a most comprehensive restructuring, not just of economy and society at all levels. Now, as I was really, um, you know, um, thinking about how do I begin this conversation, which is just exactly what is going to be, you know, a conversation between comrades, not so much um, a presentation, because I do not, for one, think um, I have any better insight than many of the comrades who have dedicated um, their lives and I think have dedicated their time with far better resources than I 
um, you know, in studying the workers' movement, but also following the trends and how um, the workers' movement has responded, both officially, but also, um, you know, organically on the ground. Um, and, and therefore, do not pretend that um, I, I would be shedding um, any better life, but just contribute to my perspective. Now, I mean, as I was really thinking about that, something struck me yesterday. Um, I, 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 you know, just accidentally stumbled into a private, um, you know, room of one young artist in Johannesburg. Um, his name is uh, Methos, quite by accident. And, and one of the things that struck me, and, and I'm not, you know, in any way an expert in, in arts or anything like that, um, but I was just struck by the fact that his paintings were all darkness and it was just gloom and all of that. And I, I asked him a question just out of curiosity because um, the only art that really ever impressed me is, you know, all the colors and the beauty that comes with that to say, you know, why would you paint, you know, um, just so much darkness and he just doesn't even see that um, there is anything really in your painting. He said, well, you know, um, these are the kind of paintings that I just do for myself and, you know, just how I feel at the moment. And I think, you know, one of the things, or rather, let me say, one of the only painting which I could really see what was happening besides, you know, others and majority which were just dark was, you know, two. One was um, the a half face. And when I asked him what it's really about, he, he told me that, well, it really represents, you know, the, the lack of visibility, you know, of a pain of people like me. And the other that was more of a very lean um, curtain. And, and he said, you know, it just represents what um, calamity this situation is. And, and in my view, and the reason that for me, I started with that is, is really because this, if you like, most graphically, you know, highlighted the situation in the epoch in which we find ourselves at, at, at much, and, and I think at, at many levels than one perhaps would have time to elaborate um, in the few minutes that I have. At the first level, of course, is just the fact that, as he quite, quite correctly explained, that, um, you know, a very slim, very limb, you know, cattle, you know, represent a great test misfortune, you know, the, the, you know, the period of misfortune um, in, 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 in the cultures of, you know, many African people here. And I think it speaks to the calamity that in reality we are living with, but also the darkness, you know, which is really a sense of despair um, that many young people feel. But I think for the purpose of this conversation, what struck me was just the gloom and a sense of despair that, you know, is a life and a plight of many people and, and, and which in many ways graphically highlight the vast, you know, ocean that Um, you know, young people who are, you know, impoverished, who are poor, and at whose expense the lockdown and all the policies in response of the crisis were carried. And of course, you know, the, 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 you know, the filthy wealth, the luxury, but, you know, not only of the rich, but I think in many ways that I think for me, this goes, you know, to the crux of the matter, um, which is what really shook me to the core of my foundations about the, the, what, what, what the representations of 
this year man that even you know the relative um you know um comfort of the change on leadership which is highlighted in a way in which um they respond to this crisis um, at one level and of course the other people and, and the working class and the poor majority in this country and across the world as a whole now i think there is a point to be made that you know while the COVID crisis has certain level of minutes i mean the matter of seconds um the reality is this is not just you know an accidental crisis resulting or rather emanating from a natural uh, disaster that nobody could have of course foreseen and nobody can can blame on the ANC as such and uh, the government and the ruling class all over the world um but you know the crisis was already here with us at one level over decades but even in a much more immediate sense. And it is an economic crisis that was already developing because this is a crisis rooted in a much more deeper and the fundamental causes, you know, in the economy and in the system itself. And I, you know, um, characterize as, as many Marxists have done as an organic crisis of capitalism. And, and what, what do you mean by that? Um, you see, a crisis, I mean, a, I mean capitalism um, is a system that is characterized by a recurrent, you know, episodic crisis once in a while. You know, Marx himself says that, you know, in a period of almost every decade uh, or so, there has to be a crisis. Um, but I mean, when we really say that an organic crisis, we mean that this um, is a much more deep going um, or rather a very deep um, structural crisis of capitalism, not just in the economy, I think aggravated as it is and coinciding in many ways with you know, the climate change crisis, but also a crisis of the system at all levels. And I mean, it is rooted and this is the point that I wanted to bring, that I want to bring forward. Um, in a much more fundamental causes, which is reflected, you know, um, in the rates of profitability of the system, which is a driving motive um, for the capitalist class as the owners of the product, as the owners of the means of production themselves. Um, a profit I've been following um, for years now. Um, and I have never um, recovered in spite of, you know, the episodic, you know, absence here and there. And, and I think that is at the root cause of the contradictions that we have seen, which have manifested themselves um, in the crisis of overproduction, in the crisis of overcapacity, um, which has driven the capitalists into speculative activity that I have no time to go into. Suffice to say that all of that combined have brought economic depression, um, which has not been seen in decades. Some are saying not since the Great Depression of the 30s. The character of which I think a number of economists have described and I have no time to go into, but in the context of the COVID, which, um, you know, has um, escalated into a pandemic in the past months and has resulted in a lockdown that we have experienced and in this country alone has resulted in the first five months of the lockdown into a five million, uh, a three million jobs been lost. Um, and I think just in the formal economy from what um, I, I, I could tell from the estimates. But of course, I think the crisis uh, of job losses is much more worse than that. But it's not just the issue of job losses, it's the fact that the lockdown has really been at the expense of many working class people who are deprived of the means of income 
and the means of livelihood. Um, much more worse is the untold stories of many um, people who um, you know, were deprived of their means of livelihood in the informal economy, traders, I mean, street traders and hawkers that were restricted um, from areas where they applied their trade to feed their family. And I think, you know, research is yet to be done, probably, but I think it will be that um, many people stopped during this crisis. I've seen a report this morning um, from one of the groups um, which, you know, we, we organized of, of, of COVID-19 People's Coalition about the dire disparation um, of the masses and the poor people in Eastern Cape when it is said um, by researchers that, uh, and that's, I, th I think actually is, 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 is an article um, quoting the gift of the, um, of the givers. Um, the CEO there says that he has never seen, you know, the dire and the disparation in Eastern Cape, which is where comrades are located. Um, that is um, the, the, the Rhodes University, um, you know, um, which they have not seen outside of the war situation. Now, I can go on and on, comrades, but I think, you know, facts, I mean, facts and figures are detailed in a number of reports and articles that I think comrades um, would, you know, have had access and have been doing rounds in number of groups in which we are organizing. The question I think which has, I mean, which preoccupies us in the discussion is how have we as a workers' movement been responding to this crisis. Now, there are obviously two ways in which the workers' movement has responded. And I think the first point to make is that the working class itself has not folded arms as you know it came under a torrent of attack <clears throat> before COVID, but also um, with far greater intensity during COVID. And what do I mean by that? It's not just the job losses that um, um, you know um, was, a mo uh, was 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 a form of attack on, on the working class, but also many workers lost their income um, at the height of the lockdown. Um, they were saying that one in three workers lost their income, but I think many more is you know stories of. Um, the untold stories of workers that um, were deprived of benefits and so on and so on, but also the restructuring of workplace um, under the lockdown itself, which the scale of which I think would only appre I mean, appreciate in months and years to come because number of changes um, have been put in place and many workers, of course, um, accepted some of the changes um, that is also those that have resisted um, with a hope that this is a passive storm and I think in weeks and months to come, you know, the situation would, say, would turn to normality. But as one worker was saying to me um, that um, in a conversation with his boss, I mean, it's one of these, um, um, what do you call, um, um, you know, penal beaters, um, uh, panel beating company and, and it was saying to me that um, you know when the lockdown started um, his boss introduced a three shifts which meant that um, actually they were working only as one third of the staff at the time and when the lockdown was relaxed and more cars when you know coming on the roads and the need for repairs were growing and the workload was increasing, um, the boss realized that he could actually make um, the very same you know shift system to continue working even post the lockdown. And he made the point that um, what the lockdown made him realize is that um, actually. Um, you know, workers are lazy, and and you know, one third of workers of workforce could do the work of you know the rest of them, and he's continuing to operate, and he's going to continue operating with a system beyond the lockdown. And this is just one example. I mean, my wife 
um, you know, is permanently working at home. And she was telling me a story of how, um, you know, her employer has cancelled. The has cancelled all the, you know, plans to construct new offices. And, you know, they've come to realize how profitable is it for them um, to, you know, have people working at home. And that, as I've seen from, you know, uh, obviously an intimate, an intimate interaction with them, means working for a much more long hours way into the night, um, not just the eight, you know, to four o'clock, um, you know, in the afternoon. Now, this is a kind of profound restructuring of the workplace and of course the industry that the capitalist class is carrying, which as I've said, will probably only appreciate um, in, in, in months and years to come. Now, workers have resisted, and there has been many strikes during you know, the, 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 the lockdowns. Um, and I think you know, this was strikes in many workplaces, particularly in the health sector, but also across the industries on issues of the PE and the PPEs, personal um, personal protective equipment, um, you know, sanit provisions of sanitizer, I mean, of sanitizers, of masks, and so on. Um, but also, you know, um, resistant generally to a sense that the bosses were marching workers to death, um, you know, in pursuit of profits and with callousness. Um, you know, and complete disregard for their health and safety during the lockdown and the pandemic. And of course, you know, lack of, you know, access to transport, but also, you know, workers in many workplaces have resisted, you know, job um, losses. Um, we see even now the strike that is, is happening at Nature's Gardens, which of course is over wages, but also is a fight back against you know, retrenchments that have taken their place there and so on. A number of important strikes, comrades. Um, in, in, in Western Cape, I know that there were strikes at, um, I think it's Tiger, you know, um, Tag Bank or something like that. Um, in, in, in Western Cape, um, the strike was led by Nuxo and, and other, you know, trade unions there. There were protests here at Baraguanas uh, by the nurses, um, but also it's not just you know, the, what is called um, a professional health staff that was resisting in, in Tiger Bank, in, in, in Baraguana, but also a number of hospitals in, in KZN and a and, and number of areas across the country. Um, it was also precarious workers in the health system. Um, and, and, you know, the most important episodes in the struggles, in particular of community healthcare workers, we have seen in, 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 in Port Elizabeth and other areas of, of Eastern Cape, but also in Limpopo and quite a number of areas here in Gauteng and, and, and across the country, as one, you know, um, community healthcare workers were obviously protesting over the fact that they were being made to use and they were being, you know, masked to the front, I mean, to the forefront of the fight against COVID um, without all the necessary tools. But moreover, um, without a recognition of how essential they were, but also the value of the work that um, they were rendering um, in the fight against the COVID, but also generally, um, you know, in, in, in managing the health crisis that, um, you know, precede um, COVID itself. And that, you know, is HIV, you know, pandemic, but also TB and other uh, public health issues that um, the, the community healthcare workers are at the forefront of fighting and so on. We, we've also, of course, had a you know, number of strikes over wages. I've already mentioned um, um, Nature's Gardens, but also there were you know, many in, in many other um, areas as well. No less um, in, in you know, the union where I organized in, in, in Swani itself, um, there were a number of strikes that took place in a number of, of, of workplaces. Um, and I think across many industries, um, there are also struggles in a public uh, sector where you would know government has wrecked a collective you know, argument 
um, signed in 2008, which was supposed to entail an increase, I think, of 7% for public servants um, this year, government pulled out of that agreement even before um, the unraveling of, of the pandemic um, uh, and so on. And I think they announced that during the budget speech um, early in February, I mean, February, March, if, if, if my memory serves me very well. Now, um, this is the resistance that has taken place um, at the grassroots in many workplaces. What has been lacking um, is a clear strategy and coordinated actions on the part of the organized labor movement. The reality is the leadership of the organized labor movement have abdicated responsibility to lead the fight in the struggle and during COVID and during the whole crisis. The, 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 the ways that I, I, I use to describe the way in which the, the official labor movement has reacted to this crisis, um, you know, during the discussion that we had internally, um, a sub two was that the leadership of the movement have accepted three million jobs being lost without a consent, but also without a resistance of, you know, uh, without a consent of members, um, but also without a fight back. And I've likened, you know, the reaction to that of the, uh, you know, the shop steward who in a workplace where there's going to be restructuring, where there's going to be retrenchments, simply without feeling a need to consult, feeling a need to um, organize, just accept retrenchment as if is a natural calamity over which, um, you know, there is nothing to be said and over which um, there is nothing to be done. Now, this is obviously unacceptable, but I think is a reflection of the weaknesses that has paralyzed the labor movement, even entering into this crisis and before. Because in what state has this crisis found us? And in what you know, um, manner has it also affected us? Now, I think divisions in the labor movement um, are obvious for all to see. Today, we have about four and five Federations, if you include um, core, you know, it's, it's called South. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's when I still exist, but I think um, it, it will probably claim that it does. Um, we have COSATU, we have SAFTU, we have, you know, FEDUSA, we have NACTU, you know, um, of all the federations that um, are recognized. But, um, you know, even within this federation, there are, I mean, if you take SAFTU, for instance, there's over 30 affiliates, um, you know, some of which are very, you know, small to be effective in leading a fight in a number of workplaces. Um, and I mean, there are many more also unions that are simply outside of this federation. Last time, I mean, I checked, there were over 100 registered trade unions um, in this country. And many of them, um, infinitely small to be effective. And that is over and above the fact that obviously we organize, um, you know, only a fraction of the working class, a very important one, of course. And I mean, by the, you know, world standard, we still have one of, you know, a very high union densities in the world. And I think it is primarily um, the heavy battalions of the working class in the mining industry, in the public service, um, in the manufacturing industries that are organized. And therefore, we cannot, you know, cry a lack of power there, so to speak. Um, what, however, um, is, is a reality is also that besides the division, the lockdown, um, you know, I mean, the pandemic itself disorientated many workers and not less its leadership as well. And that was reflected in the way in which many of our trading leaders responded which was to close offices, you know, send, you know, just send stuff home and all these things and so on. And I'm not um, in any way saying that 
we ought to have been reckless as to not to I mean, as to not take account of the dangers of the pandemic uh, of the virus to the health of our staff, but to say that there are certainly measures that we could have taken, uh, we could have put in place to ensure that unions continue to function as optimally as they could under circumstances, um, and of course continue to engage and coordinate the systems that was organically emerging in many workplaces as workers were defending themselves, you know, um, against the COVID and against obviously the determination of the bosses to overcome the crisis, both of the pandemic, but also the economic crisis that preceded the pandemic at the expense of workers through, of course, you know, a very relaxed um, and, and cuts, you know, on spending on, you know, the necessary preventative or protective equipment to our members, uh, the mask, the, 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 the mask, the, the sanitizers, but also a transportation that would have ensured that those of our workers who had to go to work in many ways, even during level you know, five lockdown, because at least in my union, they were working in a food industry and other essential services which had to operate if society was to have a chance of fighting and resisting this pandemic, of course. So in that sense, um, the workers were never really, you know, uh, or, you know, the, 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 the struggle never ceased. Exploitation continued in many workplaces as capitalists, as employers were profi profiteering out of the crisis, um, were taking advantage of the fact that workers were genuinely scared of gathering, you know, of, of protesting in many ways that, you know, trade unions, um, closed offices weren't functional. They were restricted also to access many workplaces to have meetings and demonstrations. Um, they were taking advantage of all of that. And, and obviously, um, the responsibility of the union movement in that situation was obviously to continue to organize um, whilst observing all the precautions necessary um, for the safety and the health of our staff members, but most importantly, making sure that we coordinate a fight to ensure the health and the safety of members in workplaces, but most importantly, that we defend the, again, the job losses and all other attacks that workers face in this crisis. Now, I think on that note, comrades, um, I want to say that um, as labor movement, or at least the leadership of the labor movement, we have disappointed in this crisis. And there is no doubt in my mind in so far as that is concerned. But of course, there is a hope. Um, having, you know, been in a state of paralysis for months without an end, you know, there, is, there are signs that the workers' movement is coming again on the sea. And, and I think, you know, the most encouraging signs seen actually coming out, I must admit, um, you know, of Pasatu, um, starting with, you know, the reactions, um, you know, the response um, among the teachers when there was, you know, the reopening of the schools much early and right in the middle of, of, of the pandemic, um, you know, the, the teachers resisted in the most unprecedented demonstration of unity. All unions, including, by the way, unions with roots in apartheid, you know, extremely conservative, wild only teachers unions came together with, you know, um, traditionally left um, teachers unions like Satu and others um, in, in unanimous opposition um, to the premature reopening of the schools. And I think for me, that is a source of hope and source of inspiration um, in the possibilities of unity um, in this period. But that did not end there. We also saw, of course, number of unions resisting um, together um, in, 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 in public health sector. You know, unions, not just Wainitu, which is a very militant, radical, you know, affiliate of sub organizing organizing nurses in particular, but 
you know, um, how itself has come out in number of, you know, hospitals, uh, PSA, Hospessa, uh, and so on. Um, I mean, especially, I think it was hospitals in both Eastern Cape, but also in, 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 in Durban, where there were number of infections, uh, including in private hospitals owned by NetCare, there was uh, strikes and resistance of, of, of nurses there um, and of all unions united in speaking with one voice. And I think even more, of course, um, a greater source of hope and inspiration for me is a declaration that has come out of sub to nec to join a call for a COSATU um, for a general strike on the 7th of October. Now, if this strike goes ahead, it will be a most unprecedented of working class unity in recent times. I don't want to say, um, I mean, yeah, no, it can't be in a living memory because there was um, there, there were joint strikes um, against LRA in the early um, or you know at the end of apartheid, um, which united Kosatu, you know, Nagtu and others. Um, but, but certainly in a post-apartheid period, um, you know, Saptu, Kosatu, and hopefully Nagtu, Fedusa will also join. Um, a strike like that um, would be unprecedented uh, in a post-1994 period and has a potential to galvanize not just the whole of the organized labor movement, but the whole of the workers, not just on the industrial plane, but you know, uh, the working class as a whole, if not on the 7th of October itself, but certainly um, beyond that as the organized labor movement, you know, escalate, hopefully. So on that note, comrades, I think, um, you know, I can say in a nutshell, uh, our response at labor movement has been disappointing. Um, the working class itself and workers uh, at workplaces continue to resist. There was no without leadership and coordination at national level. But also, there are sources of hope and the situation is improving and we hope that it will continue to improve in that manner. And I think all of us will take our place in pushing for more actions in a period that lies ahead. Thank you. One, one of the things that's always difficult with these Zoom meetings is uh, how do you applaud? How do you speak when somebody has done such a good job? But I, I think uh, I, can see, uh, I can see some people putting on icons. I can see some smiles. I think thank you, Comrade Sabay, for, for laying out and, and helping start uh, this very important conversation. I mean, uh, we, we, we will open up for some, some questions and, and discussion and, and maybe even debate and disagreement. I, I think um, co people can either raise that as, uh, as a, an issue of um, in the chat or we can, you can just speak. I, I think everything is going well. I see there, yeah, there we go. There's some claps, there's excellent comrades obey. There's that, completely agree. So Com, if I'm getting you right, the, the one thing is you, you're saying we, we mustn't uh, treat this as a, a simple act of nature. The crisis in public health, the crisis in the economy precedes this. We already hit 10 million job losses last, last year. Um, and secondly, that, that the, the psychological side of it, that the working class and its leadership was, was disorientated quite a lot and workers were afraid of gathering. So that's, that's part of where we're at, but there are also signs of, of hope. So I think that that maps it out quite nicely. And I think uh, maybe, maybe if people want to bring in some questions, uh, comments, uh, he has a good time. Got the man on the line. I, I see one hand there. Is that uh, Luca Macola? Uh, let me, let me, how do we unmute this comrade? Can you unmute yourself, Luca? I'm just going to see if I can see others here. It's a, we should have got the webinar software. <laughs> it's a problem opening cheapskates. Okay. Um, Comrade Luca? Yeah, I got only two questions. Uh, I want to know how uh, has 
international capital and, and local monopoly capital, both the state sector and the private sector, has on a more macroeconomic scale been restructuring the economy in response to the crisis. The second question is, I, I heard like we, we, the working class has been responding and there has been not much coordinated leadership from uh, existing organizations. My question is, with that in mind, how, how are we dealing or thinking around the, the sort of contradictions that exist within the working class, uh, like the put South Africa movement first, you know, the rise of nationalism and populism, which is taking advantage of, of the situation, and also the exacerbation of gender-based violence even during this time. So how is the working class movement or the labor movement responding to these contradictions in taking advantage of it from below? Uh, those are my two questions. Welcome. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just moving around here. Is there, is there another question there? Okay. All right. Um, well, let, let me just throw in one as well, uh, Comrade Sabay. Um, I, I suppose part of the question is, is also unions and the unemployed. Um, we know at one stage, Kasatu made an effort, the Unemployed Workers Coordinating Committee, to deal with the, the, the question of the unemployed, to integrate people in the labor movement. The issue of whether when workers are retrenched, they remain part of the union is, is another thing to think about. And the third thing is, I was speaking to a comrade in, in, in Numsa today, and they were saying, well, you know, the issue of co-ops as, as something which unions did in the past. So. For me, my question is, are the unions really thinking about uh, the unemployed and, and where that fits into organizing strategy after, let's say, after retrenchments, after consultation, section 189? I think, Comrade Sabay, you want to come in? Yes. Um... Thank you, sir. I mean, just to start with the last, they, I'm just going to respond on this one, starting with, um, I mean, you know, our, our own, you know, a program as a union, is that we want to revive um, the structure of the unemployed that um, we had as Jewisa in the past. Um, and we think that in the context of this crisis, where more and more um, component of the union resistance um, to job losses and, and, and going forward. And, and obviously that is linked with a strategy of how then do we overcome the, the unemployment of these workers? In my view, and I mean this, um, we, we took to the Congress of, of QSA itself, is that, um, you know, we should build us on a strategy of open. For a second, I think. Yeah, I think you. I think you're back. Can you hear me, Jay? I can hear you. I can hear you. Let's go. Put you back to speak of you. Come to look. Yeah. Oh, I can hear you. Thank you. Hmm. you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Yes. I don't know where did I, you know, um, did I lose my connection, but I was saying that we're reviving, um, we're we are reviving, um, you know, the structures, um, members that um, we had in the past, um, you know, which we think would play a very vital role um in our resistance against a growing unemployment and jobs and i also think that speak to the issue of 
you know, what then do we do about their unemployment? My view is that, um, you know, we need to think carefully and, and strategically about how do we see, and especially, you know, the means of production and lay of factory and mine closures. Um, I mean, I was um, in discussions with communities in Limpopo where a number of mines have been closed. And I was saying to them that we can't, you know, be having a growing unemployment, young people who are idling without anything to do in a situation where, you know, mines are here, you know, doing absolutely nothing, um, you know, except that um, they are saving to hold menders. Um, for the balance sheets of the big multinational corporations that, um, you know, um, keep them under care and maintenance. In my view, either they use those licenses to ensure that they continue employment, you know, of our members, Okay, uh, we, we've just lost uh, the comrade a bit. Okay, contradictions of fourth industrial revolution, yeah? Right here. Sorry, comrades. For you're back, Tom. For your back, good stuff. Yeah. You're back? Yeah. yeah, no, I don't know what's happening with my connection here now. Uh, because, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, the, the point is that the, yeah, that we should be occupying, you know, closing and closed mines and factories. Um, you know, and build out of that, you know, workers-owned cooperatives um, to defend jobs and livelihoods of our members that are faced with a growing unemployment in this situation. I do think that, you know, that can no longer be left to chance. That has to be a, a deliberate strategy that the workers' movement must put forward in this period and make sure that it invests the resources um, in organizing and building campaigns around, you know, such occupations um, as we tried, you know, some of us um, in the 2008-2009 crisis and the man line factory occupation in the south of Johannesburg um, is one example of such occupation, but also possibilities because my view is that if there was only thing that led to a defeat of that factory occupation, was not lack of determination on the part of workers. If anything, their organization campaign of solidarity, which involved many of the comrades that are there, I mean, that are here in this conversation, um, you know, um, defeated the, 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 the attempts of the previous boss uh, to continue production, but also uh, under a different name to strip the factory of assets and also, you know, the police um, you know, the, 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 the police who were on their side and, and tried to, you know, wrestle the factory from the workers. What lacked was, of course, you know, a support from the organized labor movement mm -hmm. to ensure that they build a campaign to force government to bail out mine, work, uh, mine line workers in the same way that they were bailing out millionaires, um, you know, across the economy um, who were, you know, crying all sorts of things to blackmail like, government to bail them out and they were bailed out mostly just so that they could line up their pockets and still go on to retrench and close factories and shops. And one example of that was, um, you know, the mines, the company that owned Aurora Mines. Um, that company, I remember that it received something like 300 and something million from the IDC just before it went into liquidation. The mines were given to Aurora which again also just stripped the mind of the assets and um, having received whatever, you know, support that they did from government um, and went on to return workers. That's what um, we need to challenge. And of course, the only alternative to that, in my view, is factory occupations. And in this situation, factory uh, workers cooperatives to seize the means of production and make sure that they defend jobs, but also to ensure that they employ those of the young people who are unemployed in our communities. Then the issue of 
how you know capital is restructuring the, the economy in this period. I've already spoken about many ways in which they are. That um, I mean, you know, my wife works in the bank, and and you know, um, as I was saying to you, that they've discovered ways in which um, they could basically make um, them. I mean, she works in the IT department to work at home, um, you know, for long hours, obviously, based on um, the work that they simply assign them, no matter the actual working hours that uh, it requires. And that is only one example. Reality is that many of us, um, I mean, myself included, have been at home and working from there for months, um, you know, now even before the official lockdown. Reality is this has intensified exploitation on and by itself, um, both by extending hours of work, literally, but also a use of technology. Um, you know, I think present many possibilities um, for extraction of more surplus than it was um, the case before. And, and that is a way in which um, capital is restructured in many workplaces. But I also think that um, taking advantage of the lockdown to you know, impose the kind of restructuring which um, were possible on the basis of you know, achievements of technology on the basis of you know, possibilities presented by the fourth industrial revolution, but which they could not you know, um, given the resistance um, and the power of the workers in many workplaces um, for them to do that. I mean, we have companies um, where um, employers, for no reasons whatsoever, basically, um, are saying, you know, they, they, they are carrying restructuring um, even in, um, you know, situation where they have nothing to do with COVID and they're just using COVID as an excuse. Um, mm. the, the, the retrenchments, for instance, at Nature's Gardens that we are fighting um, were proposed long before COVID, but they're using COVID to actually carry them out. And, and Nature's Gardens uh, has been working throughout the lockdown. And it's not just at Nature's Gardens. We have the same situations um, in many pharmaceutical companies, in Artco, one of the big pharmaceutical companies, Artco, which you also organize, um, is carrying out retrenchments. Uh, but this is a company that, um, you know, situation has never been better for it because the demands for pharmaceutical products have exploded during this process. I mean, I look at my own house, it looks like a small pharmacy because now we treat every minor, you know, illness, even things that in the past would really have just, you know, ignored. I mean, if I have a cough, I don't know how many um, medical products I take um, just, you know, <laughs> out of a panic. And, 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 you know, it just, they, what I'm trying to say is that they profit from, from the hysteria around the COVID, but yet they are telling us that because of COVID, they have to restructure, they have to retrench workers. And I'm talking about retrenchments of hundreds of workers. It's not just in this pharmaceutical industry. I mean, the company that you also organize in South of Johannesburg here is called Codicraft, um, but also another one called Bashik. They have relocated their operations to Cape Town. I don't know what is happening there, that these employers are relocating there um, in, in, in number of instances, more than just in these two companies, maybe, you know, labor day is much more cheap. I don't know what is happening. But these are things that have been done under lockdown, knowing that workers are constrained by restrictions on gathering, restrictions on demonstrations. Um, but they are obviously using that to carry out that restructuring. But the point I'm saying is that this is only a tip of an iceberg. Reality is, the world as we know it is gone. The, the, the depth of this crisis is said that, you know, um, everybody recognizes that we have to look at a different world post COVID. And the question is whether that would be world restructured in the interest of the working class or in the interest of the capitalist class. Now, that is a question 
for the struggle of the living forces. And so far, the leadership of the working class, the leadership of the workers' movement have abdicated responsibility. Not less, even at the level of working out a theoretical program that can begin to shine a ray of hope as to what possible world are we looking at beyond COVID, beyond the lockdown. We have no such a vision, we have no such mm -hmm. a program on the basis of which we can mobilize the whole of society and the whole of the working class. Yet, never in the living memory have we, have, have we had a crisis, an opportunity that this crisis actually presents. When everybody recognizes that it cannot be business as usual. Thank you, Kong. I see quite a, a lot of that's. I see quite a lot of questions uh, coming up on the side, and I'm going to try to bring all of those together. Um, so, so just just bear with me on that. Um, but what you're saying reminds me of what uh, Comrade Mazuku Jaga once said: that the crisis has arrived, but we're not ready. It's not our class that's ready this time. And I, I think that's a very key problem we generally face. What what are the methods? What are the strategies um, that we can to move on? And I think there we, we carry with us a dead weight of sectarianism, a dead weight of uh, substituting uh, personal fights for class battles. And I, th I think we, we really need to use this opportunity to also reflect on, on ourselves as the left and the labor movement. Now that allows me to kind of bring into the various questions. So I'm going to go through them. I apologize to people if I summarize them a bit. Um, Patrick Bond asks, he says, Comrade, that was excellent. Your diagnostic analysis is convincing that the problems precede COVID. Now, um, he says, how should people react? You've, you've partly covered that. But he raises here an, an issue which I, I think will, will come up in, in other people's minds. What, what are the overlaps and potentials for alliances between, for example, Marxists and social democrats? Is there a space for a Keynesian reformist agenda? Um, that's, that's the one question Comrade Patrick asks, and you're welcome here, uh, Patrick. The other thing he asks here is, could the uh, general strike being proposed for October 7th perhaps generate transitional demands that can attract other progressive layers, feminists, youth, environmentalists, NGOs, progressive intelligence, etc. So that, that is uh, Comrade Bond. And it, it's, there's a related question there from um, Warren McGregor and Cheryl Abrahams, which I, I think we can package with that. Comrade Warren is asking, what, what, what is the actual platform of the strike in, on 7th October? And what role and scope is there for the rank and file to drive this process? And what is being looked forward to for continued collaboration after the strike? So that's also raising the question of alliances and broadening the, the movement beyond uh, just the big battalions of the working class. Uh, Comrade Cheryl Abrahams also says, to add on Comrade Warren's question, are there discussions going on with other uh, organizations? outside of organized labor. I mean, I think we all recognize Casato and Softu working together is, is, is a good development, just as say, uh, say Afrikaans on a basis, any working together with Sartu is, is very important. Um, I, I've noted com, uh, comrade Rob, uh, Robert Krauss, so I'll come to him in a minute, but just reading through the other questions, uh, and Klein Klambata, who we're also welcome to this meeting, uh, Prof. Klein Kla is director of ISER at Rhodes Institute for Social and Economic Research. He, he's raising, I think it's more a comment, we have to reflect on the commercialization of the unions and the business model of unions competing for revenues. Um, and what are the negative effects of this uh, on, on workers? Um, Sofiso Masongo, uh, comrade, you're welcome. He says, um, what are the opportunities and the way forward for future employment? And what can we exploit in this situation? I, I think that's, that's a very important point. Uh, Robert Krauss um, had a hand up. It's not a written comment. Uh, Robert, you want to just speak to that? Where's Robert gone there? Thanks, Jamia. Um, 
Thanks, um, thanks, Comrade Lucien, and, and thanks, Comrade Sabat, for really illuminating, um, sobering, but, but but also at the end, motivating um, needle from discussion. But um, I think I said I've not posted it, but I said, like, I think we've identified the the big blockage, um, um, not objective circumstances. I mean, there are challenges of his objective circumstances is fear, um, and 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 the militarized lockdown. That that is kind of lessening, but. Um, the big of uh, the leadership and the bureaucracy um, and and the kind of self-interested and short-sightedness and lack of motivation. So what would, and, and, and given that occupations or basically anything that goes beyond a normal protected strike um, for to, to last and, and to also have, enable workers to have the courage to continue doing it requires a lot of support from the, from the and, and, and big campaigns that involve machinery of, of unions. Um, Except for in certain circumstances, and which again requires the requires the union official, the union bureaucrats, as well as as the leadership to to contribute. So, what do you think it will take for, for that shift to happen? Um, and and do you think, based on engagement um, in the sector with with, with 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 kind of union officials and 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 people and establishment within the unions, are they starting to feel the pressure from the rank and file? Or even just historical circumstances. Is, is there now is there is there a shift like, like maybe signaled by the Kassar to um, general strike and stuff to join? Do you think there's a beginning of a shift of perception that actually we we um, in the in the final analysis to even save our own positions and unions, we 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 have to um, start responding proactively. Um, and yeah, are you getting that sense, or were we not there yet? Thanks. Thanks, Comrade Robert. Sorry, I missed one other hand. I'm going to take that. That's Comrade Ayan Dakota uh, from Unemployed People's Movement uh, here in Makanda, um, which, which comrades may know is in the middle of a sort of a court battle with the municipality and as part of a much larger struggle. Comrade Ayanda, the, um, it's not a floor, but the, the tech is yours. All right. Thanks, uh, Comrade Lucien. Well, my, my, my question briefly would be, I think one comrade made this point. Uh, the issue of um, what we have seen, uh, that how the struggle is, is being racialized uh, on a daily basis uh, between black and white, uh, that in this struggle of white, and, and there's little or, or no mention at all uh, of class consciousness. Maybe the comrade, the dead weighted that you spoke about. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, uh, we see that uh, this line being pushed uh, by the freedom fighters uh, and also the, the, the sentiments of anti Indians. It's something that we have seen also during the FISMAS Fall. Uh, uh, that even the black, it's, it's no longer a political term as, as it would be under, uh, understood by the likes of people. It's like black is in pigmentation. Maybe comrade can say, uh, it has got everything to do with, with how uh, the left has become so weak. Uh, that's number one. But also number two, the, how the, the unions, uh, the organograms or, or how the unions uh, are organized or structures. If you try to engage the Howard Rhodes University or you try to engage the local South to come to me. It's, it's always like this now. They are waiting for a national leadership to give the line. Uh, so we all have to wait for the le uh, national leadership. What does the uh, national leadership say? Despite that there are issues that we can uh, confront and, and, and struggle together with the local South to Rhodes University things that affect our communities. But it's more like, no, we have to take a line from the national leadership. That's number two. How the unions are structured. Uh, I mean, the issue of democratic centralism, uh, centralism which is also part of this movement of, of, of the left. Uh, the number three was raised, the issue of, again, the unions, their interest in the, in the investment companies and the corruption in unions. Uh, we know what happened to SAMU, um, how the, the unions could be bureaucratized, and also how they continue to play the big brother, despite that you've got the movements uh, that have been part of this battle pre-1994 and post-94. Uh, they've always been in the uh, 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 trenches, and some unions continue to, to, 
I mean, there's continue to be this big brother, that, okay. And uh, it's more like uh, these are lumpen <laughs> movements. So we are an organized labor, which, which I find it quite uh, very, very, very problematic. Uh, maybe you can say something even there, uh, uh, Comrade Sebi. Yeah, and also we have seen during this COVID how the NGO have occupied, whether you look at the COVID-19 national group or uh, provincial groups, the NGOs have occupied that space and we know the limitations of NGO. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning good. We know the limitations of NGOs that they never, uh, they've never hated uh, uh, people because of their limitations. But I mean, we continue to see how the NGOs uh, continue uh, continue to be to the forefront. Yes, and and uh, the, the 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 question of unions. Thank you. Uh, th thank thank you, Com. Um, I think there's a huge package there for Comrade Sabay. So I'm going to hand over to him now. I, I think, uh, and then we will we'll take an assessment from there. How are we doing for for time? So Comrade Sabay, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Chair. And I think, let me just start with questions that have been raised by Comrade, you know, Ayanda. Because I think for me, you know, the question is raising about how the union movement relate with Comrade struggling in communities is probably, you know, the central question of a working class strategy today, perhaps than at any given point in time. And in the discussion that we had, and I mean, I'm talking here, in the presence of the deputy president um, of, 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 of SAFTU, and I think um, you know, she can bear witness to that. You know, I made the point that you know, the, the, the union movement, SAFTU in particular, but even if you take SAFTU and you know, lump it together with all trade unions, and let's say, which in the best scenario they represent about three million workers, represent but merely a fraction and a tendency within a broad working class. And let's remind ourselves what that actually means in numbers, in facts and figures. On the industrial plane, over 15, over 16 million workers are employed in this country. We represent only about 3 million if you take all the unions combined. As sub two, we only represent about 600 to 700,000 members, a tiny fraction of that. But it's not, the working class is not just the employed workers. There is over 10 million unemployed workers in this country. In addition to that, you know, there are other struggles as well. You know, over the learning conditions of about 15 million young people that are in schools in this country, 2 million in universities and colleges who are fighting and we've seen in the, in the marvelous movements and demonstrations of the FISMA4, what power they represent when they are united, when they are organized, when they are fighting. The workers' movement is powerized not so much only in the numbers that it represents. And of course, it occupies a special place. And I'm saying that not with arrogance that I think Comrade Koda, I mean, encounters, and I think which, you know, I, I detest, you know, of many union arrogance who, I mean, union bureaucrats who are very arrogant, um, you know, towards the rest of the working class and so on. They, they occupy a special place because what a trade union movement represents is an organized power of the working class at the point of production, which is a nerve center of society, and at which the workers have the capacity to stop the wheels of industry and therefore the capacity of the capitalists to churn out profits that drives their system. In that sense, there is a special place, but that is a power 
that the trade union movement must mobilize in order precisely to organize, to unite, and to mobilize the rest of the working class for a fight. And there is no shortage of determination to fight. In fact, the recent report that has been released by University of Johannesburg, comrade Kate Alexander is leading um, a research on that and so on, demonstrates that, you know, communities have been the main theaters of the struggle during COVID. And it was a case even before COVID. In March, he points out, she points out that in March, we had 250 protests, which was the highest number of protests in any single month, I think, since the records have begun. What has shown is that the working class is fighting but also is not fighting on the industrial plane only and even mainly for that matter. And the question for me is how do we then begin to mobilize all of that energy, all of that capacity and all of that determination to struggle on the part of our class to make sure that um, you know, we contest the terms of the fight against the pandemic, the terms of the restructuring, but also begin to build a movement that can shine light on the possibility of a different future, which I want to argue that would only be a future on the basis of a socialist transformation of society. And that for me takes me to the question that has been posed by Comrade Patrick. Because it's raising the issue of the unity with the Canadians, it's raising the issue of possibilities or perspectives for you know, capitalism post um, post post COVID. Now, perhaps to start the starting point is that we, we need to build a non-sectarian movement. For me, if they are reformists within the movement, because you know reformism is a tendency within the working class. There is no running away from that fact. You know, and and to say that we can never unite with reformists, we can never unite with Canadians, um, is to be sectarian. And that's not the way to build a movement. What is important at this point in time is to unite the working class. But in doing so, we must also be honest about what crisis are we dealing with and what are possibilities, prospects for resolution of this crisis and perspective for capitalism in a period that lies ahead. I think in a material for that matter, which um, I owe to, you know, um, I owe, you know, to the generosity of Comrade Detik uh, himself. Um, Chris Malagani, you know, um, brilliantly demonstrate, you know, how the tendency or rather, um, you know, the tendential, you know, falling of profitability have been asserting itself in a South African economy, in a South African capitalism, um, over a whole decade. And for us as Marxists in particular, that is very important. But not just for Marxists, for, for the rest of the workers' movement, because profitability of the system from the point of view of the capitalist class determine possibilities of concessions to reform. When the capitalists are making profits and a huge profits of that, of course, they are more willing to throw the crumbs on the tables of the working class, you know, relatively, you know, with a relative ease than when they are in a crisis and their profits are at the bottom, which means Comrade Patrick, it will take nothing short of a class war to even gain or to even win the most minimum, the most basic, the most modest, you know, of the reforms and the demands of the working class in many and in all the theaters of the working class struggle. That is the reality here. And the question is, if it will take, you know, 
a movement on a colossal scale, you know, of a class war to, co to, to, to force concessions out of capitalism. Why stop there if the same force and the same movement you need to defeat the resistance against reform on the part of the capitalist class is the same power, is the same movement you need to change society? Because on the basis of capitalism, we can always be considered, confident that what they can, what they concede, and we can force them, of course, to concede certain reforms today. They would, of course, at an alias opportunity, as long or as soon as the balance of forces are again restored in their favor, take away that and those reforms. Now, the only way in which we can ensure that we deprive them of that power is by, of course, expropriating them, not just politically, but also economically by seizing the banks, the factories, you know, the farms and the means of production and place them in the hands of the working class through a democratic control and management of the factories and every workplace to ensure that the economy is planned in the interest of majority of society to meet the needs and of course to make sure that we overcome all the crises of unemployment, shortage of housing and of course the poverty of our people and of the working class in this country and beyond. And I think that is also the only way in which you can also realistically deal with the crisis of, 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 of xenophobia and of GBV and other things and so on. Because the reality is, you know, the, the, the economic crisis of capitalism cannot but also assert itself in the political economy of a bourgeois family as a basic unit of production and reproduction under capitalism. The explosion of GBV that we have seen in recent months, but also in recent years, in the lead up to this pandemic and the crisis, is rooted in a massive retrenchment of many breadwinners, you know, from their jobs. It's rooted in the deepening crisis of the working class at all levels of society. And that is the reason that um, it is here in the country with the biggest inequalities in the world. It is here in this period of the crisis when many breadwinners are losing jobs and are being thrown into you know, unemployment, when the poverty, when the hunger is deepening, that we at the same time see explosion of gender-based violence. That is not to excuse it is to explain its material roots in the crisis of capitalism itself. And unless we also begin to make inroads in these economic foundations of the gender-based violence, but also on other forms of the wars of the poor against the poor, including xenophobia, including resurgent racism, by the way, um, you, know, um, you know, of many white working class people who, unlike the black working class, have the memory of apartheid and how the youth have jobs and life for them at least was better under that and those conditions. And that uh, unless we begin to mobilize the working class on the possibility of a different society, of course, we'll see the working class turning on itself in a form of gender-based violence, in a form of xenophobia, in a form of racism and all other you know, um, you know, prejudices that obviously the capitalists and the ruling political elite exploit within the working class to escape, to scapegoat, you know, sections of the working class for the crisis of their system. And I think for me, that also speaks to the point that the question that has been raised by, by Comrade Warren. And, and the reason I think for me, you know, it, it, it goes back to, you know, the, the, this, despair which I think was represented um, in a much more vivid form um, in, in, in the creation of this year that I talked about um, in the beginning of my, my introduction to this discussion, that how do we 
begin to mobilize the rank and file of the Tegu movement. And I want to say, not just the rank and file of the Tegu movement for that matter, but the whole of the class in the possibilities of the alternative to this crisis of capitalism. One of the issues that we began to flag at level of sub two is learning on the past experiences of the struggle against apartheid. You know, the process that led to a formulation of the Freedom Charter, where there were agents, if you like, of that Congress of the people who went to factories, to communities, urban and the most remotest rural corners of this country, in the farms, in the mines, collecting demands, you know, of people of society post apartheid. Now, this is not to comment on what came of the charter. I'm not from that tradition. I'm very critical of it. And I do think that it was never in any event a charter for the liberation of the working class itself. Of course, what it represented is aspirations of many working class people but who from the beginning of the formulation of the charter met a pretty bourgeois nationalist leadership of the Congress movement who were hell-bent on making sure that the outcome of that process is a program that is not incompatible with capitalism and their own aspirations to advance a black capitalist class within the framework of the capitalist post-apartheid South Africa. But the point that I want to make is that that is probably one of the most broadest mobilization of the working class and the oppressed majority of our people in this country behind a process to formulate a vision about it as I think it was, right from the beginning itself but to formulate a vision of a possible alternative. I think the leadership of SAFTU, the leadership of the workers' movement must set aside for itself to embark on such a process. And I believe the success of the 7th of October present us with possibilities of momentum for such mobilization. These are the proposals that some of us have raised in sub two and some of us we believe that leadership of sub two must take in a process beyond the 7th of august to engage both the rank and file but not just of the trade unions uh, not just of sub two but of course having conversations with the unemployed comrades in the unemployed movement um you know not just um in 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 in, in you know um in in um, what, what is that uh, municipality of, 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 of uh, uh, where there's roads? Yeah, um, you know, at roads, uh, no, 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 that, there's a city there, Gramstown, uh, but there's a new name, I think. Um, there's Makana municipality, Makana. Makanda, correct, thank you very much, Bishop. So, not just in Makanda, but across the country, as I've said, working class people in this country have been fighting, and I think, you know, there is a point to be made that for years, when the labor movement was trapped in the dead end of collaborationist class, you know, um, you know, multi-class alliance, that is ANC, which, you know, the tripartite alliance, which has done nothing but to ensure that a post-apartheid South Africa, you know, you know, becomes what it is today, which is a very ruthless, um, you know, capitalist society, of course, you know, um, 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 that um, has so far, you know, continued, um, you know, at expense of many working class people, resulting in, you know, the inequalities which um, I think put to shame, even the legislated system of inequality that apartheid was, but has more importantly also made sure that um, exploitation is intensified and that you know, is reflected also in the falling share 
of you know labor wages as a share of the national income in this country and of course a corresponding rise um you know in that period of you know um you know the the, the profits of of the capitalist class which of course um for for, for completely different reasons um have of course begun to decline um as the crisis of of over accumulation of capital was beginning to assert itself which is what has put us or rather um led us to where we are even before a covid 19 which is the reason that some of us question possibilities of you know a reformist um transformation of this crisis and i do think that for me that is reflected in the strike you know a capital strike but also lack of confidence of the capitalist class in the health and the future of their own systems the 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 the, the figures speak for themselves and and you know even before this crisis a capital formation that is the investment of the capitalist class in the new factories in procurement of machinery equipment and investment of that in productive process um, had declined from you know close to seven percent increase on yearly basis um in a period of the boom from 2008 to 2008 prices um to less than one percent and that is not about improve in fact in the material that in a different context i was exchanging with um the net no net bank um group was showing that the 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 the, the, the what they call it? they call it um net bank um capital expenditure project listing which track you know investment projects was showing that the you know to the, the first half of 2020 recorded the lowest number of investment projects since the listing started in 1983 and the lowest value since 2001 that is before a period of the boom that preceded the 2008-2009 crisis now all the promises of Ramaphosa um for you know a massive investment for which the men travel across the world seducing you know the capitalist investors about south africa being open for business you know in post zuma years um all of that would come to nothing, not only because the capitalist class is lacking confidence in the future of their own system, but in fact, they are cancelling even the projects, you know, for which they had made a commitment. And, 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 and I think um, what has then become obvious is that all of these targets for investment um, would not be realized, and in fact, um, investments will plummet in the future. That means, comrades, there is no hope on the basis of this system. The capitalist class themselves have no hope, have no faith in their own system. Why should you? Why should you think that they will be able to create jobs when they are not investing? And why not begin to have conversation about other possibilities, which some of us argue is only possible on the basis of socialism and the labor movement and the working class is capable of organizing and uniting around a vision for such a possibility. I think um, this is, yeah, but maybe, maybe let me just come on the issue that Ayanda raised of the, um, you know, the, the search in, in identity politics, because that's what we're really, we're really seeing here, Comrade uh, Ayanda. I mean, um, most of what passed for black consciousness today has absolutely nothing in common um, with what the black consciousness movement of Biko um, and his generation actually represented. But, you know, um, a very divisive, you know, reactionary identity politics of the likes of um, Gitama, but also um you know their corresponding um you know um politics in in the feminist movements 
um, but also growing white nationalism um, in a number of Western countries, which is a reaction to a deepening crisis, uh, of course, of capitalism, and, and, and you know, the attempt to scapegoat that on sections of you know, the, 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 the working class, and I'm talking here on, 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 on white nationalism that we see in Europe, in America, right wing populism um, in the US, um, you know, um, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, Johnson himself in Britain, um, Modi in, in, in India, and quite a number of countries where the action is in full swing, you know, um, is, is in many ways a, a reflection both of the deepening crisis of, of capitalism, but, but also the failures, you know, of the working class and its leadership in particular to provide a viable alternatives. For me, and, and, and this is where again, and what I think haunted me about, you know, the conversation that I had with this young man, that, the, 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 that for, for, for him, all that he feels is darkness. And, and what that said to me is that this is a generation that is open both to revolutionary possibilities, but failing which anything that seem to promise alternative, even if that is on the basis of the dead end of counter-revolutionary reaction of xenophobia, of rioting, populism of all sorts and all forms. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Com. Um, I don't know if we've got time to do much, much more. I see some participants have left. If if people want, we can definitely do a few more, uh, another question or two. Um, but I, I think the the some of the big things, maybe just to draw together, um, that have come out, are that this isn't business as usual, but it's a crisis within a bigger crisis. And that the, the weakness of the working class movement, and in particular the, the political weakness of the working class movement, is, is a, an important part of that story. So when we see things like the rise of Modi or Trump, I, I think we need to ask ourselves if it's not the left which is bringing down neoliberalism, uh, perhaps, perhaps it's, it's something else happening, um, a victory of the right, and what that means. And I think this is profoundly tied to the question of the loss of, of a utopian, and I use that in the best sense, vision, that things can be different. I think um, even for us that were not really in the Marxist tradition, but maybe coming from anarcho-syndicalism and so on, you know, the, the effect of 1989 is still being felt. And when that's coupled to ideological counter-revolution in various ways, the rise of postmodern theory, um, a big pushback, uh, identity politics, things are going to be, I think, quite tough. And in my view, at least, I think a uh, perspective is of the long march. We need to rebuild and we need to be ready for battles. But uh, en enough of that. Let's see if there's any... any other comments? Any other questions? Uh, I see it, somebody popped up on a chat. Okay, absolutely, comrades. Obey. So I think that's agreement. Um, let, 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 me, let me close here by thanking everyone for attending. We will be putting a recording of this online. We will be having our next session in October, not on the 7th of October, but uh, on around... Uh, in the week of the 20th of October, and we'll have another union. So we will, we will have different perspectives. As Comrade Sabay said, it's not a simple thing of carries the line, it's about a conversation. And I think into that conversation there are many things we can feed. Uh, Comrade Patrick Singh raised around uh, Keynesianism. We, we need to raise that question, what, what is the scope for an enabling state? Can we use the state? Comrade Numbume raised the issue around corruption and state capture. What, what does this mean? Do we find ourselves as the left taking sides between uh, uh, Ramaphosa and Pravin or, and on the, choosing between that 
and Zuma and uh, his cohort on the other side, or is there a third thing we can do? And I think fundamentally it all comes down to a bigger question of how do we unite the class? It's not an easy thing, but it can't be done with a declaration either. So Comrade Sabay, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you to everybody who came today. Um, in, in one way, it's maybe a bit of a depressing uh, discussion, but I find it very inspirational. Comrade Sabay, do, do you have any last words? And, and then we will, we will close. Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, Chair, there is every reason to be hopeful. Um, you know, in the future of the working class, in the future of, you know, humanity, because for as long as the working class is fighting, um, you know, there is a reason to be hopeful. We are not defeated. Um, you know, there has been a setbacks. Um, we have disappointed ourselves, um, but I think many of the comrades that are here and many more out there through our organizing, through our mobilizing, through our day-to-day -day, you know, activities to build our movement, we are in our own way contributing to a resistance that has been building up and the resistance that has never stopped even when the leadership of the movement has failed. Um, and I think for me, that is a source of inspiration. A crisis like this, one thing that we can be certain is that can only be a prelude to a mass upheavals, probably like nothing we've seen in our lifetime. There is no any other possibility that I can imagine. Before a full time of a reaction, the elements of which are, of course, you know, on the march in the victories of reaction um, in number of leading countries, you know, Donald Trump, uh, Moody, and others, and all the things and so on. Before all of that translate, you know, into full, you know, reaction and, and, and counter revolutionary historic defeats of the working class, the working class would have many more opportunities. Trump has inspired, uh, or rather, you know, in his own way, inspired, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter in America itself. Um, you know, there's been many fights in Brazil. Um, many people across the world are assisting. Before these lockdowns, there were movements in Middle East, in Latin America, and, you know, um, in North Africa, there were resurgence of those movements. Um, that we have seen, that of the movement that we had last seen, you know, in 2010, Arab Spring and so on. In China, in Hong Kong, you know, a, system, a Chinese Communist Party dictatorship was being challenged, you know, the, by the masses of young people in Hong Kong. All of these movements, comrades, are a source for hope, but also a clear on call for us to organize, because I think. Time is not on our side. Everything is possible. This situation is explosive. We need our organization to be strong, to be ready. And I think to lead a fight and a fight for a new society and a fight on the basis of revolutionary change and transformation of our societies. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, it's a bit hard to clap, but I'll clap for everybody. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Comrade. Thank you, everyone, for coming. For those who, who raised questions, thank you for that as well. Have a safe night and enjoy Heritage Day. <laughs>